Okay, let, let's start all over again. Hello, everybody. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. And Allison, thank you. Thank you. Are you enjoying Songs of Ascent? What a blessing. I, I, I think that music is the highest art form. It just penetrates to a place in the heart that nothing else really can. I'm amazed over and over again how in a two or three minute song, something can be said that takes a preacher an entire hour or longer to say. And uh, it's just such a blessing to, to meet the Lord at that beautiful intersection between heart and mind in our souls. And that's what music does for us. I'm enjoying it thoroughly. Well, we're going to do two things this morning. One, it's, it's kind of disconnected. Did you, did you notice that uh, the video was my personal story or a part of it? Did you know that the person who was addressing you in the video was going to speak? Well, it's a little strange for me because I have to tell you something. As I was sitting there, honestly, I just realized, you think, well, how could you not know that? But it just dawned on me that I was born here in Riverside. Um, many years ago, and it wasn't very far from here that the things I told about on this video actually occurred in my life. And so I just sat there realizing, wow, this is my home. Even though I'm from Oregon now, um, this is really uh, where I was born, and I grew up not too awfully far from here. So um, that's a little bit of my story. The reason I shared that with you this morning is because we're doing a video project that is going to involve maybe 30 or 40 videos that are short in length like that. Just, just five to seven minutes. That one was about six minutes. And those videos will be available free of charge on the internet to be emailed, like handing out tracks door to door, but handing out videos computer to computer. We are literally living in a communications revolution. Have you noticed? About five million people a week are signing up for Facebook. Every week. I mean, it's a phenomenon. It's, it's just going around the world and encompassing the globe, and people are communicating in ways they never have before. Billions of emails are sent every day. Billions, not millions, billions of emails. Well, what we're doing is we're designing a series of short messages, not 30 minutes long, not an hour long, but just five to seven minutes, making one crucial point in each video. The one you just saw, of course, was regarding suffering and why there is suffering in the world and just bringing the mind through somebody's experience to the point where a person can realize that God is not responsible for the evil and suffering in our world and that we need to look elsewhere for the cause of evil. That's the only point that was intended to be made. But it's made in the form of a story and a process of reasoning that I think will begin to reach people's hearts. And we're going to do that with many subjects. You'll be able to click on these videos and not only watch them, but a field will open and you can type in anybody's email address, a personal message. Hey, John, we were talking the other day about the existence of God. You're not sure. Check this out. It's only five minutes. Click. It appears in his inbox. He clicks on it and he's watching a video. And so, so I'm just wondering, this is kind of a beta test. Just, just to get a feel, I'm looking at your faces right now. Is that the kind of tool anybody here would use? Okay. Just, just, just sharing it around, just trying to get a feel for whether or not this is a form of communication that is effective. And uh, so anything you want to share, any corrections, critique, anything. We're about to make more of these. So if, if you have anything to share, please do. Well, this morning, I want to launch into a message that is the continuation of our series, picking up where David left off last evening. And uh, we're in a journey together, beginning last night, with the topic of intimacy created. Were you here last night? Well, let me ask it this way. How many of you were not here last night for the message that did shame on you? Where were you? <laughs> I so wish you would have been here. That message just, just went deep into my heart and made a profound impact on me. And I wish that you could have been here, and I want to encourage you, if you were not here, to, to take special efforts to acquire that message and to hear it for yourself. We, we last night learned about the point at which intimacy was created. Now we're going to, with a note of sadness, we're going to talk about the point at which intimacy was broken. 
But we're not going to dwell on the brokenness. We're going to, we're going to lift our gaze. And we're going to begin to creep into this afternoon and this evening subject matter to talk about the complete restoration of intimacy. So with that little bit of an overview in mind, um, let's just unite our hearts together in prayer one more time, preparatory to the message. Father in heaven, we lift our souls to you this morning. We are men and women that you have made for fellowship with yourself. Lord, we want to know you more intelligently. We want to serve you more passionately. There are things about you that have escaped our notice that if we could see them, would awaken new energies inside of us. There are things we have believed about you, Lord, that are completely false, that have created psychological and emotional barriers in us toward you. And we pray that you would break those down and that we would find ourselves reaching out to you with new desire this morning and throughout this day. Lord, please use me right now. Take charge of my mind and my tongue and allow me the privilege of speaking on your behalf. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, I'm just wondering, have you, ever, have you ever thought about what was going on in the universe before we existed as human beings. I mean, it sounds almost philosophical, like why would you even ask a question like that? Uh, our mental hard drives are not capable of processing some information. Some things are simply out of our orbit. We, we can't grasp them. So, so when we think of this idea of eternity past and the existence of God, it, it's, it's almost a, a, an exercise in futility. But I want to tell you something. While we cannot comprehend as human beings, as finite human beings, the nature of God and His eternal existence, Scripture is very clear that we can comprehend the character of God. We can comprehend the way God thinks and the way God feels and the patterns in which God behaves. We can grasp the beautiful, deep inner workings of the divine heart. And when we grasp who God is at heart, it wakes inside of us, it awakens inside of us a desire to come into fellowship with Him so that, so that all sense of obligation and, and duty toward God out of fear begins to subside and we find ourselves living for God simply, profoundly, because we love Him, because we want to, because we have glimpsed something in His character that is desirable and it's drawing us in like gravity is pulling us toward Him. So I want to ponder with you the question, the simple but profound question, what was going on in the universe before we existed as human beings? This is what we might call a pre-creation picture of God. Now, the Bible begins with words that we're all familiar with, right? Say it with me. What are the first words of Holy Scripture? In the beginning, God. And then it goes on. He created. But I want you to notice that in the beginning, God and God alone existed. Just think about it for a moment. We're created beings, which logically drives us to the conclusion that there is a point at which we came into existence, which logically drives us to the conclusion that there had to be a point at which we didn't, what? Exist. There was a point at which you and I, we were nowhere in the universe whatsoever non-existent. Just not there. And human history, according to biblical chronology, is relatively short. I mean, it's not that long ago that God created the first man and the first woman, Adam and Eve. And if you go back just one baby step in history, just right before the creation of the man and the woman, Adam and Eve, there are no human beings anywhere in the universe. Let me ask you, how long had there not been any human beings? 
Well, 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 that's the part that makes our, our brains kind of wobble and smoke begins to come out of our ears. We just can't grasp it. How long had there been no human beings? Well, according to the Bible, there were other beings who existed before the human race. You're aware of that. We know that these beings existed before we did because according to biblical chronology, according to chapter 38 of the book of Job, these beings, whoever they were, whoever they are, they shouted for joy. They sang when human beings were created, which means they witnessed the creation of planet Earth and the human race, which means they predate us in existence, right? These, these are the angels and the unfallen worlds. Let's just leave it at that for right now. These are other sentient, volitional, rational creatures that God made before He made the human race. But again, they're created beings, yes? Which logically means there had to be a time when they didn't exist. So if we go back to where none of the angels existed, and none of the worlds existed, we are face to face with the profound reality of God and God alone, before creation. God is the only, can we say it this way, the only uncreated being in the universe. The only one in whom is unborrowed life. The only one in whom there is immortality to give to others, but it's original with himself. God and God alone. How long had God existed as God and God alone? Again, how can we even grasp it? We don't even have the vocabulary to explain to ourselves what it would mean for God to have always existed. But listen, the moment we come face to face with the reality of God and God alone, in, in the next moment, a rational process, Scripture informs us that God was never actually alone. God has never known anything like isolation. Let's put it like that. God has always existed in fellowship, in friendship, in community. I mean, there's a sense in which God and God alone is a neighborhood. God is... A group reality, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit existing in a beautiful ebb and flow of self-giving love, reaching out, reaching out, reaching out, and receiving in, receiving in, receiving in. The Bible opens by introducing to us that kind of God. The Bible opens by introducing to us not God in a generic sense. The Bible does not say, in the beginning, deity. But in the Hebrew, there is a name there. Do you know the name, the first name of God? Elohim. Genesis 1.1 says, in the beginning, Elohim. But this is a very strange name for us as human beings, because it is a plural noun. It's a what? A plural noun. Now, that would be like me introducing myself to you this morning and saying, please to meet you, I'm Ties. And you can only draw one of two conclusions. Either he is making a very ill use of English grammar, or he thinks there's another one of him. <laughs> there is no real sense in which I could speak of myself in plural terms, you understand. I'm a solitary individual. I'm, I'm tied, not Ties. But there is a plural dimension to Ty's existence. Because Ty is married to a girl named Sue. And we have three children, Amber, Jason, and Leah. And collectively, as a unit, we are the Gibsons. And is that a proper use of plural language? Yes or no? Yes. There's a relationship going on in that family unit. Elohim is, as it were, God's family name. It's God's community name. It's God saying, pleased to meet you, I am more than one. Another way, 
that the Bible says this is in the three beautiful words, the most powerful words in Scripture, the most powerful, meaningful, ram-packed, full of significant words that any human being can ever utter. God is love. God is love. By which, the Bible does not mean God is a silly, sentimental, shallow, cotton candy, sweet, Hollywood kind of love. No. The word love, as it occurs in Scripture, is something entirely different. It's elevated. It's beautiful. It's incredible. What does the Bible mean when it says God is love? My favorite definition of the word love in Scripture is the one found in 1 Corinthians 13. And, and you know 1 Corinthians 13, love is patient, love is kind, and so on. But in verse 5, there is this line that defines love in a way that opens a passageway of understanding to the character of God. It says love, King James Version first of all, seeketh not its own. New International Version, love is not self-seeking. So, so you'll notice that that's a negative grammatical formulation, right? Love is not something. Love is not what, everybody? It's not self-seeking. It doesn't seek its own. How would you flip that? How would you turn that around and formulate a positive grammatical declaration regarding what love is? If love is not self-seeking, what is love? How would you say that? It's selfless. I like that word. What else? I heard somebody say... It's, Louisa, it is other-centered, right? It's self-giving. I mean, think about this. In order for love to exist, for it to occur at any given moment, in your life, in my life, in reality, in order for love to exist at any given moment, there must be both a self and a other. You cannot experience love if you go into the bathroom, lock the door, and never come out for the rest of your life. You can't experience love. Love only occurs when there is some other to love. So when the Bible says God is love, right? And that God existed before human beings existed, before angels existed. God existed in love. As God, before all of creation, we are automatically driven to the conclusion that God is composed in some sense of both self and what? Other. For the Father, there is Himself, and then there are the others. Who are the others for the Father? In His view, in His relation, there's the Son, and there's the Holy Spirit. And for the Son... Who are the others? The Holy Spirit and the Father. And for the Holy Spirit, who are the others? The Father and the Son. This is the nature of God. This is the character of God. God is profoundly, simply, a God of infinite other-centeredness. God has always existed in hyper-passionate awareness of all others above and before himself. This is who God is, as he is introduced to us in Scripture. But let's peel back the layers of this love just, just a little bit more. Because there are, there are insights in Scripture that show us the personal dimension of this love and how truly intimate it is. For example, we have times in Scripture, listen, when we overhear the Father speaking of the Son. The Father describing His relationship with the Son. For example, Zechariah chapter 13 and verse 7. The Father is speaking of the Son, looking forward to that time when Jesus will become incarnate as our Savior, and thinking of that upcoming event of the Incarnation. The Father says, Awake, O sword, against 
my shepherd against the one who is my, does anybody know? My fellow King James Version. My companion New King James Version. The one who is close to me New Century Version. The Father, when speaking of the Son, describes him in terms of companionship. He says, in essence, the one that I'm sending into the world, I want you to know who he is to me. He's my companion. He's my friend. That's who he is to me. Well, in chapter 42 of Isaiah, verse 1, Again, it's the Father speaking of the Son, of the coming Messiah. And get this. He says, the one I'm sending to you is the one in whom my soul delights. The Father says, I delight in the Son. What does it mean to delight in someone? What does that mean? What does that look like? Do you have anyone in your life, and I'm not talking about your, your dog Fido, I'm not talking about your, 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 your kid, cat or your goldfish, I'm talking about, is there somebody in your life that when you're in their company, when you're in their presence, you are delighted. Your happiness quotient is rising. You enjoy their company. I hope there's someone like that for you. I hope there has been someone like that for you. I hope there is presently someone like that for you. Listen, God enjoys that kind of reality, that kind of companionship. He looks upon Jesus and he says, this is the one in whom I delight. In chapter um, 8 of Proverbs, verses 30 and 31, you have personified wisdom articulating the relationship. And according to the Apostle Paul, wisdom with a capital W, wisdom in Proverbs is the pre-incarnate Jesus. This is Christ before his incarnation speaking to us as wisdom in Proverbs. And wisdom, that is the pre-incarnate Jesus in Proverbs 8, speaks of the Father. And he says, the Father delights in me. And we enjoy one another's company. And we embark upon engineering projects together. I'm giving you a modern translation. We, we create together. We enjoy one another's company. But I want you to notice, Jesus says, the Father delights in me. I just asked you if there's anyone you take delight in, right? That's incredible enough. Somebody that you really enjoy being with. But let me ask you this. Let's just turn that around a little bit. Is there anybody you know, anybody you have an experience with, and you know they take delight in you? Slightly different. I know I delight in my wife, Sue. I love spending time with her. But when I arrive home from a trip, and I see her come to pick me up at the airport, and I know her by her very mannerisms. I can just spot her out of the crowd. And I see her turn around and look at me, and I see in her eyes, her smiling eyes, I'm glad to see you. I like you. Come hither. <laughs> when I see Sue after being on a trip and we come back into one another's company and we just sit in the car together and drive home, there's a certain delight in just being in her presence and not only knowing that I enjoy her, but that she, wow, this is amazing, she actually likes me. It's an incredible thing to realize. Here's Jesus. And he doesn't tell us, and this is true as well, he doesn't tell us, I delight in the Father. Of course he does. But Jesus is reveling in the fact that, that, hey, I want you to know, I have a life, I have a reality in which I know that the Father takes delight in me. 
This is the kind of relationship that exists within the beautiful inner sanctum of the Godhead. This is the kind of love that has always existed at the foundation of reality. This is the kind of love that God has enjoyed for all eternity past. Well, then in Genesis 1, we shift gears. Because in verse 1, we meet God in the beginning, Elohim, this God who is more than one and yet, by virtue of this love, simultaneously one, three who are one. We meet this God, but then this God of other-centered, self-giving love embarks upon a project. An incredible, exciting adventure. Down in verse 26. Then God said, and again the name there is Elohim. This plural one. Then God said, let who? Let us, who's us here? Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let us make man in our own image. According to our likeness. Skip down to verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So who's, who's conversing here? Who is speaking to who? Let us make man in our... We're over here in a conversation. At this point in the story, human beings haven't been created yet. They don't exist. The, the author is allowing us the privilege of listening in on the pre-creation conversation. Who's speaking here? God. To whom? God. God is speaking to God. Maybe it's the Father speaking to the Son and the Holy Spirit. Maybe it's the Son speaking to the Holy Spirit and the Father. But the us here is Elohim. This plural God of infinite other-centered love. And this God embarks upon the creation enterprise. God says, as it were, hey, here's what we're going to do. We enjoy this, this incredible relationship, this friendship. We enjoy one another's company. We delight in one another. Let's make others like us. Let's make some others that we can lavish our love upon and we will create them with the capacity to love us in return and to love one another. This is who we are. Every man and woman and child here this morning and every person in the world is embraced in this creation declaration. God made us to experience the same kind of love that exists between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Literally, science right now, right out on the, the frontiers of knowledge, scientists are discovering that human beings are literally engineered for love. The evolutionary theory has dominated the scientific community. But recently, there is data accumulating that is suggesting that we are not biological survival machines after all, for whom the highest law is self-preservation. We see self-preservation, we see selfishness all around us. But the data is revealing that we are actually something more, something different. That this self-serving impulse is contrary to our survival, not in its favor. We are not biological survival machines. Science is proving over and over again that biologically, Psychologically, emotionally, we're more like love machines 
We are utterly and completely dependent on the outgoing flow and the incoming flow of love for our health and our sanity and our stability. One study has demonstrated that if, if, if I just reach out my hand and take yours and I say, how you doing, brother? I don't even know you. What's your name? Tony, I'm Ty. And we meet. And we have this contact. Right now, Tony, you may not know it, but science tells me that your white blood cell count is going up. Yes. You are better prepared because of that simple little affectionate interaction between two human beings. You are better prepared to survive. You are better prepared, I don't know, are you coming down with a cold or you feel a flu coming on? Cancer? Nothing. Okay. So, whatever it is that ails us as human beings, we are better suited to deal with it in a, in a climate and atmosphere of affection and love and community and interaction. How many of you are, are health nuts and you like natural remedies? You like natural remedies? I'm going to tell you about some natural remedies. Well, one in particular, uh, for years, my wife has said, it's charcoal that we, we need for this ailment, or it, it, it's golden seal that we need. Have you ever had golden seal on your taste buds? Yes. It, is, it is one of the worst flavors ever to come into existence. But you know what? Not a whole hot and cold shower. I might do some of that. But, but here, science is telling us that the best natural remedy is to exist in loving relationships. So if I feel a cold coming on, or the flu, or cancer, I say, baby, I say to my wife, Sue, listen, I, I need a natural remedy. Could you just snuggle here with me a little closer? And I feel my white blood cell count just goes off the charts. So there's a natural remedy for you. There's a fall in love. That's a natural remedy. And it's not just between husbands and wives. If I take my daughter Leah in my arms. If I take my son Jason in my arms, something akin to the heart of God is occurring. Something that is a replica of the image of God is occurring in those simple interactions between husband and wife and parent and child and friend with friend. According to Genesis 1, we were created, we were engineered for love. Not the silly, sentimental, shallow Hollywood kind of love as I mentioned, but for a profound relational integrity and faithfulness. We were made to live in other-centeredness, in self-givingness, if you will. That's who we are by nature. But then we shift gears again. Because according to Genesis chapter 3, something terrible interrupted this flow of love in human experience. In chapter 3 and verse 1, we read of the fall of humanity. And I'd like to suggest to you that the fall of man is, in a very real sense, a falling out of love with God and with one another. The story, as you know, involves a serpent who enters the garden with an agenda. Notice the agenda in verse 1. Now the serpent was more, what does your version say? Crafty, subtle, cunning. Let's put it this way. He has entered the garden with an intent to deceive, right? And then we immediately notice that the object of his deceit is none other than God himself. And that the human heart is the target for receiving this deception. The serpent was more subtle, more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, note the language, Has God indeed said, You may not eat of every tree of the garden? What's the first thing you notice here? Is there, is there some kind of implication in the words? What's the implication here? It, doubt is being cast upon the word of God, right? 
Has God indeed said you may not eat of every tree of the garden? Question, is he accurately quoting God? From the context, we know that he is misrepresenting God's intent. Ever so slightly, though. This is amazing. God, in chapter 2 and verse 16, had framed the subject in terms of a vast horizon of freedom with a minor restriction, and that only for their good. God had actually articulated it like this. Of every tree of the garden, you may freely eat. But of this one, you may not. Because if you do, you'll die. Right? Vast horizon, minor restriction. But then, then, Satan comes along and he says, Has God indeed said you may not eat of every tree of the garden? Is that what God said? No. He frames it in terms of restriction. With minor liberty. He doesn't even mention any point of liberty. The first part of this deceit, of this lie that the devil spins, is to deposit the idea in the human heart that God is restrictive. He is a God of arbitrary, cruel restriction. He's got his thumb on you. He doesn't want you to be free. He wants you under his control. He's restrictive. But then the devil goes on. And he says, if you eat of the tree, God told you you'll die. But I'm telling you, what does he say? You will not die. What's the second part of the lie here? God's a liar. He said you'll die. I'm telling you, you won't. You're not going to die if you eat of the forbidden fruit. That's the second part of the lie. God is restrictive and God is not trustworthy. He's a liar. But then... Then here's the kicker. In verse 5, the devil suggests the motive that lies at the deepest root level of God's heart and what makes God who he is. He tries to define the character of God in verse 5. For God knows that in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be as God's knowing. You will be like God knowing good and evil. What's the implication here? Read between the lines. God is restrictive. God is lying to you about this death thing. You're not going to die if you eat the forbidden fruit. Why? Because God knows something you don't. God knows that when you eat this fruit, you'll be elevated to equality with Him, and He certainly doesn't want that. God is, what did you say? God is selfish. God is self-serving. God doesn't actually love you. He's only looking out for his own best interests. Now, when Eve reaches out her hand to take the fruit, that is not where the sin problem began. The outward act of disobedience was merely a manifestation of something that had occurred just right before the act. What had occurred? She believed the lie. She received in her, into her heart the idea that God is restrictive, He's not trustworthy, and He's essentially self-serving. Summarize all of that. God does not actually live for you. He doesn't love you. He's only living for Himself. This is who God is. And the moment humanity believed that lie, Rebellion followed, and a self-serving impulse arose in the human heart. Immediately, the sin problem took on a behavioral dimension, a behavioral manifestation, and rebellion against God in an act of sin. But the problem lied in the deception regarding the character of God that prompted the act of disobedience and rebellion. In other words, human beings came to the place where they didn't trust God anymore. They didn't believe that God is a God of love who created them for love and was living for them rather than for himself. 
And that is the lethal, primal lie that the devil has palmed off on the human race. Notice the results of believing this lie. Immediately, as our first parents take this into their hearts and minds, their natural impulse is to run and to hide in fear of hell. What had their relationship with God been like prior to this? Close, intimate, open. God would come in the cool of the day, and what was their immediate natural impulse? Here he comes, Eve. Let, let, let's, let's, let's go see him. There was this immediate desire for contact with God. Open fellowship with the creator of the universe. And now God comes into the garden. And their immediate impulse is quick, run, hide, here he comes. Question, why are they afraid? Has something changed in God? Where has the change occurred? In them, in their own perception of the character of God. Are they justified in being afraid of him? Are they justified in hiding him? This is arising from their sense of shame and, and guilt and the lie that they have believed. Suddenly, they cannot feel free to approach God. And all they can feel is fear and the desire to hide. And so it logically follows that if the sin problem is to be remedied in human experience, what must occur? There must be a revelation of the love of God that would undo the distorted perception of the character of God that led to the breaking of trust, that led to the breaking of intimacy, that led to Adam and Eve, the human race, feeling the need, the desire to hide from God in fear. A revelation of the love of God is what's needed to rectify the problem. And so we continue the gospel story as it unfolds in Genesis. And we discover that God embarks upon a plan. And this plan, paradoxically, involves a severing of intimacy within the Godhead itself. In Genesis chapter 15, we read of the first time that God communicated to the human race regarding the breaking up of this intimacy between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. God tells Abraham, I want you to do something. I want you to enact what it's going to take to save the human race. I want you to get three animals, Abraham, and I want you to sever the animals, each one of them straight down the middle, cut them in half, and lay them out in a pattern on the ground. And once the animals are on the ground, laid one side across from the other, three animals severed. Genesis 15 says that Abraham goes into a deep dream state. And while he's dreaming, a sense of dark horror comes upon him. And in his vision, he sees something like a burning torch of fire pass between the severed pieces. This is all symbolic. God is communicating something here. What is he communicating? Well, in biblical times, the way a covenant was made was in this very manner. The cutting of an animal sacrifice into, and those entering into covenant together would then walk through the severed pieces to indicate that they were making a promise that they would keep at any cost to themselves. They were making a promise in which they were essentially saying, I'm giving myself to you in covenant agreement, and may I become as this severed animal if I don't keep my promise. God 
takes that symbolism and graphically communicates to Abraham and through him to us. That in order to save the human race, God himself, the Godhead, will necessarily have to undergo a severing of relationship. And that's exactly what we find occurring in the sacrifice of Jesus. The Gospels inform us, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that when Jesus comes into this world, He came into this world from a pre-existing state. The Gospel of John chapter 1 tells us He came from the bosom of the Father. He came out of eternity past, out of this intimate relationship with the Father, into this world, there was the initial separating of himself from the Godhead, from the Father, from the Holy Spirit. When Jesus comes into this world, there is a separation that is occurring. And the Bible informs us that as Jesus walks this path of sacrifice in our world, that he will then come to the place where the same sense of dark horror that came upon Abraham's mind, the same sense of separation that Abraham envisioned would occur within the Godhead itself. The Apostle Paul says in chapter 2 of Philippians, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, made himself nothing, New International Version says. Another version says he emptied himself when he became a human being. He emptied himself of what? He emptied himself of his divine prerogatives and powers. He emptied himself of omnipotence and omniscience and omnipresence so that he could literally become a human being and undergo the separation that sin makes between God and human beings. Until Jesus comes finally to the cross and he cries out from the depths of his soul, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In that moment of self-sacrificing love, Jesus felt to the depths of his being the separation, the sundering that occurs between God and human beings because of the sin problem. And in that sacrifice, we see a revelation of the sublime fact that God literally loves you and me more than His own life. Mm. And in loving us more than His own life, we begin to realize that the lies we have believed about the character of God that break trust and sever our relationship with Him are unfounded. And that God is beautiful beyond description and that in knowing Him, we return to the very purpose for which we were created. Purposes of intimacy and friendship with one another and with God. I have a friend. And we were sitting at a table together. I thought we were there to have lunch. But he was just kind of picking at his food. I knew something was wrong. I could feel it. So I communicated to him with my eyes. Just in silence, I glanced across the table, smiled a, a little smile, and just with my eyes I said, I know you're going through something and I'm here for you if you want to talk. Out of nowhere, he says words that I couldn't have imagined. He says, man, Ty, Katie is leaving me. She just told me. She's gone, Ty. And I so want her back. It wasn't even my experience. And a wave of nausea came over me. I could 
feel his pain second hand. I can't even imagine what it would be like to go through that. Katie's leaving me, Tom. And I so want her back. According to the gospel, an ache and a pain that real is hanging over you and me and over the whole world. God is looking upon us and he feels the separation that sin has made. And can I say it this way to you? He so wants you back. He so wants me back. And the question is, do we want him to? Do we want him to?
gracious Father, just knowing who you are and what kind of God you are is deeply healing for us. We are inclined to be afraid of you. We are inclined to hide from you in whatever it is that presents itself to us in this life as we consume our energies and our focus. But deep inside of us, Lord, we, we sense that we were made for fellowship with you. That you crafted us, heart, mind, and body, to live within the beautiful experience of your love. Thank you for sending Jesus into this world to put that love on display for us. We feel you calling us back to yourself, Lord. We know that, that over our world, over each of us as individuals, there is a profound, deep ache in your heart. And that you want us back. You so want us back. And so we pause to voluntarily, to willingly, Say yes to your love. To give ourselves back to you, Lord. To allow the broken intimacy to be mended. We come back to you. In Jesus' name.